What is the ultimate EMP proof bug out vehicle? There's lots of YouTube videos and lots of opinions on the topic, but what is the truth? Will your bug out vehicle function after an EMP? Let's dig into it. So hi, my name is Jonathan Hollerman with Grid Down Consulting. Uh, today, the topic at hand is going to be EMP-proof bug-out vehicles. Uh, this is going to be a little bit longer form video, so hang with me to the very end to get my top recommendations. With that said, let's deal with the 900-pound gorilla in the room first. EMP. What is EMP? EMP is an electromagnetic pulse from a nuclear weapon detonated high up in the atmosphere. Now, there is a plethora of bad information on YouTube on EMP. How do I know this? Uh, so my background, aside from running a company, Grid Down Consulting, where I work with high net worth clients and help them build evacuation plans, bug out vehicles, survival retreats, and the like. I am also the deputy director of the EMP Task Force on National and Homeland Security. I sit on the board of advisors for Impact America. I'm part of the Secure the Grid Coalition. Uh, I, I'm invited to and regularly attend infra, the FBI's InfraGuard uh, meetings, which are on EMP protection for the government. And um, uh, one of the biggest events that I attended here a few years back, uh, I was invited to be a member of the Electromagnetic Defense Task Force. That's a joint services uh, wargaming op uh, operation down at LeMay Wargaming Institute, Maxwell Air Force Base. And basically, it was all your alphabet agencies sitting around talking about a nuclear EMP, how it would affect the country, how it would affect the military, and would they be able to respond. So that's my background. Uh, there's a lot of people on YouTube that put out EMP protection methods for electronics and for vehicles and things of that nature. Uh, the problem is, is in almost every case, they're working off publicly available information. And when I say publicly available information and protection standards, I'm talking about uh, Mill Standard 188-125. Now that document for EMP protection for the military was written back in 1981, okay? And it's been declassified. And there's a reason why you have access to it, okay? Uh, since then, in 2000, uh, Congressman Roscoe Bartlett and some other congressmen and women met with some a top general from Russia who warned us that they had developed super EMP technology, which was four times stronger than an off-the-shelf nuke like we had originally planned to defend against in 1981. So with that said, we had to go back to the drawing board. And over the last decade, uh, the U.S. military, uh, who has access to the classified documents, uh, some of the test data that we got from China after the fall of the USSR and uh, looking at, you know, the, the capability of the, the new weaponry, which Russia, China, North Korea, and likely Iran all have these super EMP weapons. Uh, they, they rewrote the standards and that's why you have access to the old standards. Okay. So that's very important for you to know. Okay. Uh, there's a reason why the Obama administration Years back, rehardened, spent four billion dollars rehardening Cheyenne Mountain against EMP and moved NORAD back into Cheyenne Mountain. There's a reason for that. Okay, so a lot of the information you're going to get on EMP protection and protection standards is just not accurate. Uh, like I said, I, I I'm regularly rubbing shoulders with the EMP commission guys and the the top engineers from some of the the, the top military testing facilities around the country. And I have the ability to ask them questions. I've been picking their brain for years. I've been attending these events. So uh, I do have a kind of a position of authority as far as to how to speak to this subject, okay? So with that said, EMP-proof bug-out vehicles. What are the top four things that I look at for EMP-proof bug-out vehicles? Number one is going to be reliability. And under reliability, not just the vehicle itself, but functionality, will it function after an EMP? The second thing that I look at is size, okay? So when I work with the client, how many people do you have to get out of Dodge? What size vehicle do you need to get you where you need to go and, and bring everybody with you? The third thing is its capabilities. What are the vehicle's capabilities on the road, okay? And the fourth thing is, does the vehicle blend in with other vehicles or not? So we'll get to that topic here in a minute. 
So first, reliability. Does the Is this vehicle going to function after an EMP? Uh, but before we get to the EMP side of it, reliability. If you're going to trust your life, I mean, this is an end of the world situation and you have to get from point A to point B. You need to get to your Uncle Bob's farm. You need to get to your survival retreat location. That vehicle has to start. That vehicle has to function when the time comes. So having a some big Bob Deuce that you had made or that, that you made yourself and it sits in your backyard nine months out of the year and you drive it once every six months, that vehicle is going to break down over time. Having a bug out vehicle that you do not use regularly is not a good option. Uh, so I would look for reliable vehicles, uh, you know, not something that is temperamental, uh, not something that's a rust bucket. So general reliability of the vehicle is important first off. Um, so on the EMP side of it, what we're typically looking for with, with an EMP hardened vehicle is a purely mechanical drivetrain. Okay. You can have plenty of electronics. You could put, you know, the latest and greatest stereo and an LCD screen and have all the whiz bang gadgets in your vehicle, Bluetooth, whatever you want. Uh, but does the drivetrain, if all that stuff gets fried, will the vehicle start? Will it run? Okay. Uh, so the first question you'd ask yourself is, are there any small electronics, computers, whatever, that govern this vehicle and would prevent it from functioning if those electronics got fried? Uh, my number one recommendation, again, we'll get deeper into it, is going to be a uh, first, second gen P-Pump Cummins, uh, which I believe is the gold standard for reliability and uh, functionality. Uh, second, uh, on the more budget side of it, would be a pre-EFI, uh, a carbureted, naturally aspiring mechanical fuel pump, uh, gas engine. Some think 350, 302, something along those lines. Uh, modern vehicles. Most of your modern vehicles have computers that govern not just whether it starts or drives, but you know, there's microchips determining the suspension systems and, and are the roads wet? When does the four wheel drive or all wheel drive kick in and kick out? Uh, and if any of those computer systems goes down, typically, or sometimes depending on the vehicle, it's not gonna let the vehicle drive if some of those computer systems for the drivability of the vehicle are compromised. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, if we're looking at, um, transmission or the drivetrain. I prefer a standard shift vehicle. I realize that's harder to get into, especially with more modern vehicles, but having the ability to, to bump start the vehicle, you know, you push it, you get it rolling and then pop the clutch uh, is really important to me. But if you go with an automatic transmission uh, or any vehicle, you need to understand how to bypass the ignition system if the ignition system gets fried and you need to understand how to start your vehicle. I would have backup relays and fuses. Every single, I would find out every single fuse and every single relay in, in both the boxes in the engine bay and down there near your door. And I would have backup fuses and relays kept in a, a metal like an ammo can uh, for extra protection. Again, they're not really susceptible to EMP, but you're going to have one in there for the next thing, which is a light bar. Uh, so almost every vehicle that I have built for clients, uh, we typically get a 12 inch or smaller LED high intensity light bar, which gets mounted underneath the bumper. And uh, we put disconnects there and then we keep a spare LED light bar in that metal Faraday cage in the truck or in the vehicle. That way, if this happens at night and you need to bug out at night, you're not out there fiddling around, fiddling around trying to swap out your headlights or sometimes, uh, you know, depending on your vehicle model, it can get, it can be hard to get to those headlights in the dark. Uh, so, and, and then there's other things in the headlights, your switch, um, your, there's a lot of switches and sensors and stuff with headlights now where the, the whole system may not function, right? So typically we have an LED light bar out there. We keep a spare, we have disconnects. So you basically just pull the one out of the box, unhook the other one, take some wing nuts off, slap the other one in there. And now you have lights for traveling. So LED light bar, a uh, backup LED light bar would be really important. Uh, and then the last point here, we'll get into it more, is aftermarket EMP proof vehicle devices that are being sold everywhere and they're on every prepper channel. Uh, they are not, the, the, not gonna name the company, they have not had a single vehicle tested with that device, not one vehicle and an EMP generator with that device. And we'll get into that more lately or later. 
Uh, size, how many people do you need to transport? How many people are you getting from point A to point B? Uh, if it's just you or maybe just you and your girlfriend or you and your boyfriend, uh, a Jeep, uh, a pre-78 Jeep with like a 350 would be a, a, a good vehicle. Again, in that case, you have to realize you don't have a lot of cargo capacity. A lot of times people have a lot of stuff in their home that they want to take with them that they don't have at their retreat or at the location. So you're not going to have a lot of cargo space, but they are very capable vehicles for maneuvering in and out of traffic and uh, going down into the median. Uh, so the next, the more likely bug out vehicle would be an older pickup truck. Uh, so something that has a bed. Uh, I prefer a quad cab or an extended cab where you can fit four or five people, six people into the, the front part of the vehicle. Uh, technically, you could put a cap on there or a box on the back and put some bench seating if you had to haul more people. So, I mean, you can haul more. It's not going to be super comfortable, but who cares? It's the end of the world, right? You're trying to get out of Dodge. So that's a possibility. Uh, four by four vans. Uh, typically, there's uh, older vans did not come four by four naturally. So if you're going to put a suspension system of four by four into an older van, uh, you're going to have some some expenses uh, to do that. That's not a cheap proposition. The last thing is you have a large group. So I may have some clients that have need to get a lot of people from one location to another. So we look at buses typically for them. Uh, you get in an early nineties, uh, a bus standard shift bus with like an international 466, which is really dependable, purely mechanical engine. Uh, you, you could use a bus to transport a lot of people. Uh, if you'd go that route, uh, don't have that be your primary and only bug out vehicle because, you know, if you come around a bend and, and you come up to this big traffic jam, you're not going down into the median with a bus to get around it. And you may get boxed into a situation with traffic behind you or something, and you may not be able to turn that thing around. So if you go the bus route, if you have a lot of people, I always recommend having another capable four by four vehicle that travels like a mile or two up ahead of the bus. Uh, and can radio back and give them a heads up if there's something in the way, at least have them stop so they can evaluate whether you can clear the road or not. Uh, otherwise, it gives the bus plenty of time to turn around and uh, maybe maneuver or figure out an alternative route, okay? Uh, so that's leads into capability, okay? So what are the capabilities of your bug out vehicle? Uh, you wanna have the ability, like I just mentioned, to four by four down through the median to, to, to get past any obstructions that may be in the road. With that said, prior route planning for your bug out route is critical here, uh, especially if you live in a city or, you know, you have to travel. It's not a matter of just jumping on the freeway and like you typically get to your survival retreat location. Uh, you may get on that freeway and get boxed in, which is what you don't want to have happen. A lot of times in the inner city, uh, especially along the freeways, you don't have medians like you do out in the country. There's a concrete barrier on both sides of that. You may have a whole gaggle of vehicles blocking the road, and now you have no way to get through. Uh, so make sure that uh, you, you, you plan your route before you actually get on the road. Uh, the ability to winch or pull vehicles out of the way. Uh, if you're going to put a winch on a vehicle, make sure... Uh, or on your bug out vehicle, make sure you get an oversized winch, not a winch that's capable for just pulling your vehicle. Get something big enough where, uh, for a bigger vehicle that you may need to, to, to pull out of the way or slide out of the way. So get an oversized winch. Uh, and can the vehicle tow a trailer? So again, a lot of times my clients, they have um, all their stuff at their survival retreat, most of their stuff at their survival retreat, but there's always going to be a lot of stuff at your house. I mean, a lot of times you want to go to the range. You don't want to keep all your guns and ammunition at, at your survival retreat. So a lot of my clients have, you know, guns, weapons, uh, plus all the extra food. No, no reason leaving any food behind for anybody else. You know, you may want to take a bunch of extra stuff in your house. Maybe your survival retreat library, a whole, you know, big boxes of books. You may have a bunch of stuff in your house that, you want to take with you. So it does make sense to have the ability to pull a trailer. If you go that route, again, uh, with the understanding that if you get in a situation, you may need to unhook that trailer. So all your bug out bags, your critical life, the things you have to have, I would have in your the, the main cab or the, the bed of your truck. Uh, I would not put them in the trailer, uh, the box trailer. I would save that for bedding and, you know, extra food or things of that nature. So 
And then the last point is, does the vehicle blend in? So the, again, there's a lot of opinions on YouTube on bug out vehicles. And I would say the, the more popular opinion is that you want to be the gray man and you want to blend in with the other vehicles on the road. Um, so kind of their thought process is, is, you know, it's a, it's the walking dead. It's a post-apocalypse. You're driving around in this, this, this running vehicle and you don't want it to, to look too tactical, right? Uh, well, first off your bug out vehicle is a bug out vehicle. It is to get you from point A to point B within the first three to four days. Uh, this is not an instance, especially we're talking EMP proof bug out vehicles. It's an EMP. It's a nationwide grid down event, solar flare, cyber, whatever. The grid's not coming up. It will be the end of the world as you know it. Societies, you're going to lose 80 to 90% of the population the first year. Uh, this idea where you stay in your home for the first two or three weeks until it gets really bad and then you bug out. At that point, it doesn't matter what you're driving. You are a target of opportunity. If you're one of the only moving, running vehicles on the road in a situation like this, uh, you might as well paint a big bullseye on the side of the vehicle because somebody's going to ambush you. You're probably not going to get where you need to go. So be sure that you get out early. And, and, and if that's the case, I don't think what kind of vehicle you drive really matters. Okay, uh, so the whole tactical, non-tactical, the same with how you dress, tactical, non-tactical, uh, is is not a major deal. Now, if we're talking a year and a half after the event, 90% of the population has died, you got little pockets of people surviving, maybe you need to start traveling, uh, you know, you've you've battened down the hatches, you've let the, the, the mass hysteria die off, uh, or the mass population of the people die off, and there's less people out and about, and you're going to start venturing out. At that point, I think it does matter whether you blend in or blend out. So if that's the case, and there at that point in time, there may be some ambushes by some groups on the road here or there. Um, so again, it's very dangerous if you travel outside of your group. But if you do go that route, personally, I would rather be in a vehicle that is very tactical looking, right? Is very kind of scary looking if that makes sense because you may have ambush groups that are barely surviving they're mostly starved to death they've got a couple shotguns and some deer rifles and they may look at your vehicle and just be like we're gonna let these guys roll on by and we're gonna wait for the regular pickup truck because that's an easier target of opportunity so in my opinion uh, when i'm building a bug out vehicle for client typically we go the tactical route uh, for long-term viability of it uh, so with that said uh, uh, you know, we're talking about matte black vinyl wrap, lots of LED lighting, brush guards, things of that nature. Um, so just making it look tactical, right? Tactical. <laughs> um, with that said, the other strategy I would use, especially for the first three days, uh, your, your bug out route is I would create large, uh, magnetic or adhesive stickers that mimic a security company, whether that's G4S or Academy, uh, I've done this a couple times with clients where, and you don't put those on today. You put that the day the crap hits the fan, you, you slap those things on the vehicle. Okay. And then you're, you dress like a Merc, right? You got your multi-cam shirt and your plate carrier. And then we have patches that, you know, for that same company Academy, we have patches, we have agent, big agent signs for the back of the plate carrier. Uh, essentially you want to mimic a private security company, okay? The reason is, is when you're traveling, you may come across a roadblock by police early on, okay? Police are not gonna be around for long, but first day or two when I recommend bugging out, you may, out in the country somewhere, maybe a small town, the mayor sends a sheriff out, says, hey, we don't want anybody passing through here, okay? If you mimic a private security company and you have a really good pitch memorized, and when you pull up, Hey, officer, uh, you know, we've been contracted to pick up a high value target. We need to get through here. Uh, can you please move your vehicles out of the way? Um, it, you know, you just have this really good pitch. Uh, there's a, I would say there's a reasonable likelihood that local sheriff, that local police officer is going to let you pass because you're in official capacity, government capacity, right? And they're not going to have the ability, not that radios would be working, but if they were, you know, it was a cyber attack on the grid, solar flare, and you, you don't want them being able to radio back to the headquarters and, you know, 
look at your uh, credentials because these are private companies. They wouldn't have the ability to check. Uh, they're just going to go off what you look like. And if you play the part, you act the part, don't act like a jerk. Don't, you know, try and lord it over. But if you have some urgency to you, you have a good pitch, I think that they'll probably let you through. Um, worst case scenario, they're probably not going to shoot at you. Okay. They're going to let you go the other way. Okay. Um, with that said, do not mimic federal or state or local agencies. Don't, you know, get stickers or, or, or metal decals or magnet, magnetic decals for like police force or, um, you know, FBI. Don't mimic the government or the military or anything like that. Uh, because, uh, they, again, if the radios are working, they're going to, they're going to want to see your ID and they're going to call back to, 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 to check your credentials where to the private company, they can't do that. Uh, and also while you're traveling on your bug out route, uh, it's early on. So it's probably not gonna be a big issue, but especially later on, if you're driving this vehicle around uh, a year and a half in, like we, we mentioned earlier, you don't want to look like the government or the military. People are going to be really ticked off that the world fell apart and they may just take their anger out, some pot shots at a government vehicle. So I would not try and mimic government, not to, you know, besides the fact that it's illegal to do so uh, in a post collapse, total collapse scenario. Uh, what are laws? I mean, you know, it's not as big of an issue, but I, for those reasons, I wouldn't mimic uh, police or local or federal government agencies. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, the psychology behind it, uh, driving around that type of vehicle, having that kind of look, I think tactical is better. Uh, but you can go the other route and just get a regular pickup truck. And if you go that route, I wouldn't dress tactical in a regular pickup truck. I would have a, like a flannel on. That doesn't mean I'm not wearing my plate carrier under the flannel, have a concealed carry uh, handgun, you know, in my waistband or whatever. But if you're gonna play the part, play the part, okay? Pick one or the other. So with that said, what are my recommendations for EMP-proof bug-out vehicles? So we'll start on the, the kind of the lower end of the spectrum, the more budget end of the spectrum. Uh, that would be a gas-powered bug-out vehicle. Uh, now, what, again, what we're talking about here is typically pre-78, uh, pre-EFI, electronic fuel injection, uh, carbureted, naturally aspiring, mechanical fuel pump on the side of the engine. Uh, at the end of the day, you have a, a, a mostly mechanical, mechanical engine and drivetrain okay so you know pre-78 ford chevy dodge pickup truck is going to be your best bet i would steer clear of like really oddball like a land rover or something like that again if you have to scavenge for parts at the end of the world uh, you're not going to find parts for a you know 97 land rover at uh, you know an abandoned advanced auto a year into this thing so uh, get normal regular vehicles that you can find parts for or scavenge parts for after the fact. Uh, so it depends on, you know, what you're looking to do here. Uh, a Chevy 350 crate engine, uh, you know, even if you get an older vehicle and it's got a bunch of miles on it, you can get a crate engine for four, five, six thousand dollars uh, pretty reasonably and have a brand new engine in your bug out vehicle where it's reliable. Uh, if you're going to do that, upgrade the transmission, you know, um, get get a reman transmission make transmission make sure it's going to be reliable for you when you go to bug out so don't buy some big don't, don't buy some rust bucket some beater some something that's been you know sitting in some farmer's field and work off that because there's probably going to be a lot of things wrong with it that you have to fix and you may get it up and running but then there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to break down so i would steer clear of like just busted up vehicles even though they're more affordable i would also steer clear of vehicles that have already had a whole bunch of stuff done to them like uh you know picture your you know rich teenage boy you know has an older classic truck and puts lift kits and does a whole bunch of fancy aftermarket stuff a lot of times cheap um i i would try and get something that's about as factory as possible and then if i want to add that stuff to it I'm, i want to do it myself because i want to know it's quality parts and a quality shop has done the work uh bump bu Let's see here. So if, if you go this route, uh, uh, you're probably going to be spending in the neighborhood of thirty to fifty thousand dollars once you purchase a vehicle. Once you go through it, and make sure it's all functioning. That would be kind of my target uh, budget. Would be thirty to fifty thousand dollars. Yes, you can buy a, a seventy-five Chevy fifteen hundred 
four by four for you know ninety five hundred bucks, but you're going to get a ninety five hundred dollar bug out vehicle that's probably not going to be super reliable, and it's definitely not going to be a daily driver. So. Uh, on the flip side of that, you know, getting an old mid '70s CJ7 with a 350 already put into it, you can get those for like 10 grand, and then put you know, put some money into it, maybe 20 grand there. But if you're looking at less than twenty thousand dollars for a bug out vehicle, you're probably not going to get something that's super reliable. So, but this is the cheaper way to go, you know, twenty thirty thousand dollars for a really nice, you know, squared away bug out Jeep. Uh, Thirty to fifty thousand dollars for a classic vehicle that's been completely gone through, and you know you know it's going to be very reliable. So EMP protection, okay. So we kind of went through uh, our pre seventy eight non EFI engines, one hundred percent guaranteed EMP proof, and I would say ninety nine percent yes, okay. But there's a lot of variables when we're talking EMP. Are you at ground zero? Uh, directly underneath a super EMP when it goes off. There are some parts of your, you know, your ignition sequence and um, those engines still have distributor caps. They still require an alternator and a starter to function and the battery to function and to get to get proper spark to the engine, right? So to bypass this, if you wanted to be 100% solid that you have a purely mechanical engine you could swap out that distributor cap and put a magneto system in there uh, similar to what funny cars and drag cars use uh, that's a purely mechanical way of producing spark uh, into the engine uh, it does not require the rest of the electrical system of that older vehicle now the the older alternators and starters and uh, your your ignition sequence to, to get the vehicle started you know that's probably okay Probably, okay? So just be sure that we're not confusing here. I'm saying probably not guaranteed. If you want to be guaranteed, you need to make it a purely mechanical gas engine, similar to a small plane engine uh, for reliability purposes, okay? Now, if that's the case, uh, I mentioned earlier about fuses and relays, making sure you have all the spare fuses and relays. You may be able to get some of the electronics in this older vehicle working. Uh, they're, they're not as susceptible as modern vehicles to, uh, they, don't have as, they don't have microchips in them, basically. But with that said, you need to be sure that whatever your vehicle, that you have the ability to start it if your key, your, your kind of ignition system gets fried depending on what year we're talking about you know if, if it is a more modern vehicle with a uh, pcm bcm tcm and you got these computers you know that are talking to your ignition when you put your key in if that stuff's not functioning properly nothing's going the signal's not going to go past that point uh the the key ignition has to be able to speak to the computer of the vehicle to even get it started once you get past that you're going to have you know a clutch pedal uh position sensor you're going to have neutral safety switch and an automatic uh, so you have these switches that the signal's got to get past that, and then it's got to get down to your starter relay, and then it's got it goes down to your solenoid. There's there's different components there that could possibly be affected by a super EMP if you were very close to ground zero. So having the spare relays and then having the ability to to bump start your you know push start your your vehicle, pop the clutch if it's a standard, if it's an automatic, know how to go up to the front fuse box uh, and pull your um, uh, your relay box and, and pull your starter relay. There's a way you can jump that with like a paper clip. Uh, what, depending on your vehicle, watch some YouTube videos on it for your model. See if you can figure that out. Uh, older vehicles, a lot of times you can climb down under there and you can you take a, just take a screwdriver and run it across a couple of the posts coming out of your solenoid and starter and, and bypass all the other ignition stuff to get your vehicle started. So learn how those techniques on how to start a vehicle outside of your, your ignition key. Okay. So yeah, uh, we talked about light bars and spare fuses, keeping that in the box. Uh, last gas powered vehicles. Um, these EMP protection devices, I'm not going to name the company. Okay. That, Hey, you put this on any vehicle, and the vehicle is now EMP proof. Uh, I've looked in depth at their test data. Uh, they have military test data, that, or they have a test data from a military facility uh, that they have on their page. You can pull it up. You get on the last page. You're going to see the picture from the E1. Okay, the E3 portion of the EMP is not going to affect your vehicle at all. It's just the E1. 
which affects small microchips and electronics. And if you know anything about modern vehicles, there's computer chips all throughout that modern vehicle. Now, yes, they even putting a lot more RF protection in modern vehicles today. But the last year that the EMP commission tested vehicles was in two, the, the newest vehicle was 2002. And they went from, I think, like 93 to 2002. Or they, I forget, two dozen vehicles or something like that. And a lot of them did fairly well. So the idea that every vehicle on the road is going to die is not necessarily true. But that was the latest test they did was a 2002 vehicle. If you know anything about vehicles in the last 20 years, they're all they're, they're basically big computers and lots of them. Uh, so we there are some newer test data. Uh, again, uh, the one that I did see was some with some new vehicles only went to 50 kilovolts per meter. You have to get one of the military facilities to get up to 200 kilovolts per meter of E1 uh, to, to, to hit a car with. So there are some big question marks there on whether that vehicle is going to function, a modern vehicle is going to function. I would definitely lean towards no. Um, and the, and again, every model is different how the electrical systems laid out, how long the wires are, uh, there, there's just a lot of factors there. And so for you to sell a device that you can plug into your car and it's going to protect every model of car, every type of car, every year, um, and not having put this device on a car and put it under EMP generator a single time. So again, their test out, if you look at it, it's for their home unit. Uh, it, it, that you go down to the last picture. It's that you can see the pictures of the test. It's for their home unit, and they had a lot of success with that product. So now they're just making it for everything else and quoting the same test data. So just be aware. Don't drink the Kool Aid. Understand what you're getting into. Me personally, I would not trust the lo- my life and the, the lives of my wife and kids to that product working. Uh, when the time comes. So again, I'm not going to mention the company by name, but if you're running in the preparedness community for any length of time, you know who I'm talking about. So gas powered bug out vehicle, that kind of covers that. That's going to be your budget way. Okay. Uh, So I'm going to kind of go through three different options, right? Option two uh, is going to be like a military vehicle, uh, like a Humvee with with the 12 valve Cummins. If you go this route, again, I would not lean towards the, the, the deuce and a halfs and some of the other older military vehicles, even though a lot of times they are EMP proof, I just don't want to be driving around in a military vehicle after, you know, society has collapsed. I just think, you know, it's problematic and those vehicles are temperamental and you have to know how to work on them. And you sure as heck ain't getting a spare part from, from Napa, you know, a year and a half into it. So you're not scavenging for parts. Uh, but the, the option uh, that some of my clients do lean towards, again, this is a higher dollar option, is going to be, a, like I said, a Humvee with a 12 of Cummins. And you're looking at, at the low end, $100,000, $120,000 to get into a, 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 a Cummins swapped Humvee. I would strongly recommend if you go this route to get the wagon version. Uh, it gives you more space in the back. With the Humvee, they're not super roadworthy. I mean, if you do put a P-Pump Cummins, you know, tune it up a little bit, 350 horsepower. Uh, it will be more capable on the highway in that instance. Um, they're very capable off-road vehicles. You're limited to four seats, like I said. I mean, you could throw some people in the back. They're going to be kind of sitting on top of each other in, in the back bed there. Again, it's the end of the world. It's comfort, you know, three or four hours of discomfort to get, you know, to your bug out location. I would I would do that in a second, right? Uh, the other limit you have is they they're really bad at tow, really bad at towing. They have four wheel independent suspension. Uh, you're limited to about ten thousand pounds of towing. Uh, like I said, if you put a Cummins in there, it'll tow a house, uh, but it's not dry because of suspension and the way it's set up. Uh, it doesn't pull it well. It's kind of dangerous actually. So you're really limited to about ten thousand pounds if you're going to put a a a Cummins into a Humvee. Now the two companies that are reputable that do this are Plan B Humvee, uh, planbtrucks.com, predator uh, predatorinc.com. Uh, so Plan B Trucks is kind of the more budget version of that. You can get get into a, a, a Cummins Humvee for around 100,000, maybe a little bit over depending on how, you know, what whiz bang gadgets you want in there. 
uh, Predator Inc. I think they're in California. I'm not 100% sure, but they kind of specialize in these conversions, Hummer conversions that are like really high end interior finishes, leather seats, and all that stuff. Uh, typically, you're looking at 200K kind of on the low end to get into their vehicles. So just be aware this is a high dollar product. Uh, I don't think it is the best option. The best option, in my opinion, for a bug out vehicle. Uh, if money is no object, uh, is to get a more modern vehicle with a P-Pump Cummins 12-valve 5.9 liter Cummins in it. The 5.9 Cummins was, is, in my opinion, um, I would say arguably, a lot of people online would, would agree, is one of the most reliable vehicle engines that's ever been made. A, a million mile Cummins is not unheard of. They almost never break down they're there it's purely mechanical engine if you're not pushing the limits on horsepower and torque and like you know running a lot of aftermarket injectors and stuff like that uh they're they're exceptionally reliable i mean they're originally built for marine applications tractor generators heavy equipment uh, in 1988 they put it in the ram 2500 which kind of started this whole ball rolling and to this day uh it's the that engine is typically what's what's used for towing vehicles i mean it's just it's a very reliable engine with little to no um, maintenance and it's at the top of the list for uh, an engine that gets swapped into another vehicle why would you swap a cummins into another vehicle why wouldn't you just use the original dodge ram 2500 because they had one of the best engines ever made and they put it in one of the least reliable pickup trucks ever made. So if we're talking a first, second gen Cummins, uh, the, the Ram trucks that were built around that engine, uh, I mean, they suffer from electrical issues, uh, depending on which transmission you got, uh, transmission issues. Uh, the, they're just very poor craftsmanship. Uh, they, they just break down a lot. They're just not super reliable. So for this reason, uh, and the fact that they are extremely sought out for, especially if you're talking about a 92 through 97.5, uh, second gen Cummins pickup truck, those things. I mean, they're used for tractor pulls. And the reason is, is that P pump, uh, Cummins, you, you can tune that thing. It is not unheard of to get well over a thousand horsepower and ridiculous, uh, like absurd amounts of torque out of these vehicles. They use them for tractor pulls and, you know, competitions. And so they're that, the, that five years of model there, those vehicles are highly sought after. If you find a 92 through 97.5 Ram 2500, Ram 3500 with the Cummins in it with less than 100,000 miles, you found a unicorn, okay? Less than 100,000 miles, not because of the engine, but because of the truck and all the other stuff. Uh, and you're going to be paying, I've, I've seen them $45,000, $50,000 for a 30-year-old pickup truck with 100,000 miles. So, they're hard to find, and I think there's better options out there. But they are completely uh, EMP proof. So if you're looking at my recommendation, which is to get a another vehicle, a more reliable vehicle, and put a Cummins into, uh, it is expensive. I don't want to lie to you. So you're probably looking at twenty five thousand dollars to to put a a remanufactured built Cummins into an alternative vehicle, a more reliable vehicle. Uh, and if you have to swap out the tranny because that vehicle's transmission isn't going to handle the, the, the horsepower and torque of the Cummins, you're probably looking at about $35,000 just in the engine and transmission swap. So this isn't a super cheap way to go, but in the scheme of things, um, what you get, I think it's worth every penny, uh, what you get on the back end of that. So the company that, that sells, uh, th there's a couple companies that sell the, the swap kits basically. So it, all your, your, um, they do electronic, the, the wiring, the, the computer bypass stuff, the, the engine mounts and, you know, where it mounts up to the transmission and the adapter plates. Uh, there's a company called diesel conversion specialists, highly, highly recommend them. Uh, you can call them, and they're very knowledgeable. They can answer your questions on doing a, a, a come and swap. More importantly, they can recommend uh, reliable companies that do a lot of come and swaps, okay? So uh, I made the mistake the first time of dealing with a, a um, 
very small shop that do, that did a lot of pulling trucks, right? They did a lot of Cummins work, but they had never taken a modern vehicle and put a first, second gen Cummins into a modern vehicle because there's a lot of electrical issues you got to bypass. You got to think of all the sensors in a modern engine that talk to the computer need to have a signal or the truck's just not going to start and run. You're going to have issues with the with the vehicle. So w- one of the first vehicles I built for a client uh, th- this way that that I that we did a, a come and swap into was a 2006 Ram 2500, uh, which was the last year for CAN bus electronics. Okay, and we took that 2500, we put a a, a second gen P pump Cummins into that truck, and it was a nightmare. I mean, this this guy told me he could do it, but at the end of the day. Uh, it just, it was a year and a half project by the time we got it all buttoned up. So make sure, contact Diesel Conversion Specialists. Again, I'm not sponsored. I get no money from them. Uh, but contact them, and they can give you some reputable shots that do a lot of what you're looking to do, okay? Uh, so w- when you get this remand Cummins engine uh, and you get this P-Pump, uh, again, I would not put a 1,000 horsepower, I would not tune this thing to the max and and run all that torque and horsepower through your bug out vehicle, even though it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun and you're going to roll coal and you're going to, you know, wake every neighbor up in your neighborhood uh, when you start the thing. uh, It's not going to be reliable. That's just a lot of horsepower and torque to be running through the rest of the drivetrain, your axles, your wheel bearing. There's so many other factors in the drivetrain that it's just going to put so much stress on. It's not going to be super reliable. So I think the sweet spot is around 300 to 350 horsepower and, you know, seven to 800 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, that is, a, in my opinion, a pretty good sweet spot. It'll give you plenty of power, uh, plenty of torque, yet it's, you know, not even midway through the, the capabilities of that engine and transmission. And uh, it'll be a very, very reliable vehicle. You can get, a, a, like I said, a million miles out of that thing. If you... Are matching this up and you have the ability to pick your transmission uh, because of the vehicle you're putting into, I would highly recommend the NV5600 standard six-speed transmission. Again, they are bulletproof, heavy-duty transmissions that are put into pulling trucks all the time, uh, these big competition trucks. Um, they can handle a 1,000 horsepower, and we're not doing that. So uh, we're just putting 350 horsepower, so it'll last a lifetime, This that transmission. Uh, last thing you need to be aware of is if you're putting a Cummins into another vehicle, that vehicle has to be able to hold the weight of a, a, a Cummins engine is a huge piece of iron ore. I, I mean, the amount of weight, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head how much a Cummins, a uh, 5.9 Cummins, 12 valve Cummins weighs, but it's a ton. So you, you're going to have to do suspension work on this vehicle, uh, that you're, you're putting it into. Just be aware of that. Uh, so again, most of the answers or most of the questions you can have are going to be able to be answered by diesel conversion specialists. So what vehicles, uh, the natural vehicle, the original vehicle, 1989 through 1997, Dodge Ram 2500 to 3500. I've already mentioned tons of reliability issues outside of the engine and transmission. That would not be my first go-to. Uh, if you can find a something with low miles and really good condition, that, that it still makes a great bug out vehicle. I'm just saying... Uh, you know, if, especially if it's going to be a daily driver, I recommend bug out vehicles be a daily driver. Um, but uh, just make sure you get a good one, okay? And you're probably looking anywhere between thirty and sixty thousand to get into a a uh, first, second gen Cummins or, or Dodge Ram twenty five hundred, thirty five hundred. Put some money into it uh, and get it squared away and ready for the end of the world. Second is going to be a, a more modern Ford F450, F550, or F550. Uh, this is a common vehicle that they put Cummins, uh, do a Cummins swap with. The, this is, it's a fine vehicle. It's just, they're huge. They're big. They're, they're bulky. Uh, they're heavy. You're not going to be weaving your way in and out of, you know, traffic uh, in a, F F550. It's just, it's kind of a bulky vehicle. So I'm not against it, but it would not be my first choice. My first choice, if we're talking about a, a the, the best, so in my opinion, the best vehicle to do a um, come and swap into is going to be a 2008 to 2010 Ford F350. 
So though that modern year is the most modern vehicle, really, without a lot of one-off customizations and you know custom computer work and everything like that. Uh, Diesel Conversion Specialist sells every kit, everything you need to make that truck function with a 12 valve Cummins. Plus, uh, if you find uh, the six-speed transmission, the the Ford Factory uh, ZF6 transmission is a good transmission. It's a capable transmission behind a Cummins, so you're not going to have to swap the tranny out too. So these vehicles are actually, in the scheme of how expensive vehicles have gotten, especially pickup trucks, they're extremely reasonable to buy. And there's a reason for that. Because the 6.4 diesel, uh, Power Stroke diesel, that was in that you know, model year. I know the four guys are going to be mad at me. You know what? If you're honest, you'll agree with me. That you know time period, those engines are pigs. They're very, they're known for catastrophic failures, you know, with not a ton of miles on them. So, I mean, you can pick up one of these trucks with a hundred thousand, you know, a little bit over, a little bit under for like 25 grand, 25, 30 grand with, with full leather seating, King Ranch, you know? Um, so this is probably, in my opinion, the best, cause it's going to get you the most modern vehicle. We're talking daily driver. It's going to have all the creature comforts that you want. Uh, the drivability of it, it's going to be an excellent vehicle, uh, you throw that Cummins in there, and it's going to make it a great bug out vehicle as well. So uh, the Fummins is what they're nicknamed, F U M M I N S. If you want to Google it, uh, Ford uh, 2008 2010 Ford F three fifty. I think that is kind of probably one of the best vehicles that you could build for a bug out vehicle, and you're going to have about fifty to eighty thousand dollars depending on how much uh, you do to the vehicle. But in the scheme of thing. You can't touch a Ford F three fifty today for under eighty grand, a new one, right? And you're basically you're getting a very reliable vehicle out of this, so uh, it's not really in the scheme of expense that much. So transition now. So let's say you have a large family. Um, a, another really good platform that's not truck based. My number one pick outside of a truck based platform is going to be a two thousand to two thousand five Ford Excursion. Uh, so again, diesel conversion specialists have the entire swap kits and everything you need to put a Cummins into a 2000, 2005. So if you don't remember the excursion at that point in time, it was built on Ford's super duty truck platform. And at that, to, to that date, it was the largest mass production SUV that was available. So they're pretty good sized vehicles. Lots of, you can fit eight adults, uh, comfortably and an excursion with room to spare in the back for, for hauling some stuff. Uh, and plus, they're just, they're, they're like I said, a more modern vehicle that's an easy swap that can be done. Just make sure you get a, an excursion with the V10 engine because that's the one that you can do the swap easy. I, I think most of them are V10s, but I think there are some V8s, but um, it, they, they don't sell the swap for that, I don't think. So make sure you get one with the V10. But they also make a, a really good tactical-looking vehicle. So that year of... Um, excursion, you know, you put a three-inch lift on it, some 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 wheels, matte black vinyl wrap, matte olive vinyl wrap, some a brush guard. It's gonna it's gonna look like a security vehicle uh, right off the bat. Uh, there are other common swaps that you can do. Uh, again, go to DCS uh, Diesel Conversion Specialists. Uh, they have an entire list of the kits that they sell for different vehicles. Again, I would steer clear of any oddball uh, vehicles that aren't common vehicles that you can find parts for. Uh, so if we're talking about gas powered vehicles, like we talked about originally, again, stick with Dodge, Ford, uh, Chevy, you know, GMC, common vehicles, stay away from your Land Rover, stay away from your, uh, old military, you know, getting a Bob Deuce or anything like that. Um, you don't want to look too militaristic. So with that said, I think I've covered all the points. Um, my number one recommendation, again, 2008, 2010, Ford F-350 with a 12-valve Cummins swap in it, I think is the number one bug-out vehicle that, 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 that I've been building lately. So with that said, please feel free to uh, leave some comments down below. Uh, hit like, hit subscribe, uh, and also go over to Patreon, Jonathan Hollerman on Patreon and follow me there. I do a lot more long-form content on that platform. As always, prepare for the worst, hope for the best, and let God do the rest. Take care, everyone.